Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Ann Bauer. <clears throat> My frog does not have a name. Um, <clears throat> And uh, it's my pleasure today to be introducing Thomas Christopher Green. But first, we have some other things to do. Uh, I just want to remind you that Bookstock runs on grants and contributions and volunteers. And so um, I see we have a volunteer with his volunteer Bookstock shirt on over there. So thank you. Um, and we have a little basket outside the room here. If you want to make a contribution, that would be helpful. Everything is free, and it's amazing what's on offer. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is thank our sponsors, because they are essential. And they are, as you've probably heard in other presentations, the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, the Pauline Davenport Children's Fund of the Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, and the Woodstock Learning Lab. And in addition, we thank the Vermont Standard, which is our media uh, sponsor, Channel 8, uh, WCTV, Woodstock Community TV, the Yankee Bookshop, which is selling books and is here today with us, and Sustainable Woodstock. Thomas Green is known to many of us through his international bestseller, The Headmaster's Wife. If you've read it, you know what a great novel it is, and I have read it, and I must say it's a keeper. He's written six novels, some of which have been translated into multiple languages, and he's earned worldwide acclaim. His latest, The Perfect Liar, from St. Martin's Press, is powerful, with twists and turns that are unexpected, and it does that terrible thing to you. It makes you miss sleep. How does he find time for all that writing when he's simultaneously engaged with the Vermont College of Fine Arts, which he founded in 2006? The school is widely recognized as one of the leading graduate art programs in the country. He still serves as its president. Retiring soon? Uh, yes, I'm on sabbatical for a year. So uh -huh. And then I'm going back to faculty. So. Uh huh, okay. I'm kind of Okay. <laughs> uh, and his work as an educator has been recognized by his appointment to the New England Higher Education Board by the governor, his appointment as a commissioner on the New England Higher Education Committee, the commission, sorry, and his service twice as president of the Vermont Higher Education Council. He lives in Montpelier. Today, Tom will be reading from The Perfect Liar, and I'm sure we'll make some time to answer questions as well. Please welcome Tom to Woodstock. That was great, Anne, thank you. How is that on the microphone, pretty good? Okay. So, um, that was a very kind introduction, thank you. You now know much more about me than I know about myself. Um, I wanna start with a story, though, before I actually read anything, because I think stories are a better way to do things. Um, this book came out January 15th, and I went on a book tour um, when it came out. Now, book tours aren't nearly as glamorous as one might imagine, if you imagine them to be glamorous, because they're not. Um, you know, you go around, you go to independent bookstores, sometimes you read in front of a hundred people, if you're really lucky, and sometimes you read in front of staff, and they wonder why nobody showed up, especially in the winter. Um, on this book tour, my opening event was supposed to be in Providence, Rhode Island, at this, uh, it, was a, it was an event with about six other writers reading, it's a place I'd been to before, it's sponsored by Brown University. It's a great event. You get two, three hundred people who come out for this, which is great for writers. And it's at a bar, which I think is really why they come out. But two or three hundred people come out and they have drinks and they listen to you read and it's great. Now the people who organized this event found out about three days before I was expected to headline with this book coming out that I was reading the following night at a small independent bookstore 45 miles away, also in the state of Rhode Island. And they were under the understanding with my publicist and my publishing house that I would not read anywhere else in the state of Rhode Island, which seemed to me entirely absurd, especially because I was reading at their place first. And if you've ever driven around Rhode Island, you know that people who are in Providence kind of stay in Providence, and people who are outside Providence don't want to go near Providence because people drive crazy. And so it seemed to me there was no competition 
But what they were asking me to do was they said, if you do not tell the independent bookstore you're reading at the next night that you're canceling, then we're going to have to cancel you from our event. And I said, fine, cancel me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to turn down an independent bookstore. There are two things I support above all others as a writer, which is small independent bookstores and libraries. I just pose naked for a library. That's a story I'll tell you another time. <laughs> That's how much I believe in libraries. Um, but I wasn't going to say no to a small independent bookstore. So I said, no, I wouldn't read there. And this other independent bookstore, sort of in a mall near Providence, saw this on Facebook, wrote me and said, hey, why don't you read at our place, you know, the day your book comes out? And I said, sure, I'll do that. But it was last minute and there wasn't much planning and I drove down to Rhode Island, middle of winter, stayed at a little Holiday Inn next to the airport where the planes were taking off all night next to my head. Um, and I went and read at this little, you know, bookstore at a mall instead of in front of three or 400 people but it was a question of principle, and there were three people who came, one of which was my niece. Um, the only book I sold was the one I bought for my niece, uh, who's a graduate student and couldn't afford it. But that was okay, and that's the way book tour goes. So the next night, I'm reading at the bookstore, which I chose over the big event in Providence, and it was down in Westerly, Rhode Island, and my publisher had set up my lodging. And uh, I was driving, I set it on my GPS in the car where I was going, and I was driving to the inn, I had all day, so I was gonna get there probably around one in the afternoon and not have to read till about seven at night. Um, and I drove down to this inn and I was following the GPS and it brought me to what looked like really beautiful part of Rhode Island, rocky coast, ocean right there, these big houses. Um, and it brought me to what looked like a private house. And I thought, well, this can't be where I'm staying, maybe it's a bed and breakfast, but I did get out and I walked up to the door and, rang the doorbell and no one answered and I kind of looked around and I'm like, this is definitely a private house. And then I looked over to the left and there was this inn sitting on top of this cliff over there and I'm like, oh, it looked like an inn. Anyway, it was big and expansive. I'm like, that must be it. So I drove over there and I parked my car and I got out and as soon as I got out of my car, there was a guy waiting for me and he says to me, oh, you must be uh, Mr. Green. And I'm like, yes, I am. He's like, well, we've been expecting you. And I said, well, thank you. That seems rather nice. Can I say, can he said, can I get your bags? And I said, sure. And he, oh, we opened the back door of my car and he took my bags and we walked toward the front of this inn. And then when we opened the door to the inn, it had a staircase that went up to where the lobby was. And it was like what happens when the Queen of England comes back to Windsor Castle. <laughs> Everybody who worked in the inn was lined in the staircase. <laughs> people in their chef whites and the cleaning people and they were all like standing like this and like I had to run the gauntlet of them and as I walked by them, everyone said, you know, welcome Mr. Green and welcome Mr. Green and so good to see you Mr. Green, I hope your drive was okay Mr. Green and I'm like thank you, thank you, thank you and I walk up the stairs and this place is gorgeous and I get to the front desk and they say to me, Mr. Green, would you like a glass of champagne? We have a bottle of Verve Clicquot, we've been chilling for you, we just opened it and I said, well yes, that sounds fabulous, thank you and they hand me a glass of champagne and, and they said, you know, sir, you know, your, your publisher booked your room, and, but we've taken the liberty of upgrading you to our ocean suite and, you know, Joe here can take you up and show it to you. And so they bring me up to the top floor of this place and this room is just magnificent. I mean, it is a bank of windows over one side looking out over the bay and on the other side it looks over this sort of tidal river that comes in. It's just enormous, it's a clawfoot tub that's up on a platform, it's kind of inexplicable, but it's there. And, you know, they said, we will leave you alone for a minute, sir, to get, you know, show me around, and they point out the window, and he says, you know, that over there is Taylor Swift's house, that's where she lives, and I was like, Tay Taylor's over there? And I look at the house, and then I settle in, and I've like got about five hours to go. There's a knock on the door, five minutes later. It's Mr. Green, the chef has prepared for you a special selection of our desserts. We know you have a sweet tooth. And I'm like, I don't know how they know this, but it's true. <laughs> and they come in with a stone tray that is covered with the most beautiful, delectable things I've ever seen, like little bird's nests with chocolates in them and then these other things and these little gummy things, these gorgeous, gorgeous desserts. And they lay them out on the desk in the office there, I mean in the office in the room. And I'm eating these and I'm drinking my Verve Clicquot and I'm thinking this isn't that bad at all. And I look at the desk and they have taken the time to hire somebody to do in calligraphy 
directions to the bookstore that night. It says, Mr. Green's directions to the bookstore. And it has on both sides. Now, I don't need directions to a bookstore because I have the GPS, right? But anyway, I'm thinking this is kind of remarkable. I've never had quite this experience before. And I'm starting to feel really like good about it. And at one point, I decide I'm going to walk out and tour the inn and go out and look at the grounds. And as I'm walking, everybody's saying hello to me. And you know, one guy is like, looking good, Mr. Green. And I'm like, feeling good, Dennis. And, <laughs> and I'm just, the whole day is like going amazing, right? Now I come back, and it's about an hour or so before the reading. And I get a call from the front desk. And they say to me, Mr. Green, we have for you tonight to go to your reading a uh, brand new 2019 BMW 7 Series sedan. Um, we can either provide you with a driver or you can drive it yourself. If you'd like to look out the window, you can see it right below when I look outside and there's this thing looks like a limousine. This giant $140,000 car. And I said, no, I think I can drive it myself. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> and uh, this has never happened to me before either. So I come downstairs and I you know, I, I get in the car, the car is amazing, by the way, and I, I driving it, ripping through these windy roads I have to myself around the coast of Rhode Island down to Westerly. I go to the reading. It's a great crowd. There's 60, 70 people there, um, which is fabulous for a winter night in Rhode Island at a small bookstore. I do the reading. The reading goes great. Sign a bunch of books, answer questions, etc. I come back to the hotel after, and I ask them, you know, is the restaurant open? They have a restaurant. I haven't seen it yet. And they said, oh, yes, yes, we're expecting you. And I said, oh, great. And so I went down to the restaurant. And they're like, oh, Mr. Green is here. He's here from the restaurant. We have, a, we have a table for you right near the window. And I said, you know, it's just me. I'd actually probably be more comfortable sitting at the bar. And they're like, oh, fine. This causes some kind of scramble for a minute. There's nobody else in this place. I have nobody in the restaurant. I haven't seen anybody else. I have people work there. And I sit down at the bar. And um, they said to me, Mr. Green, we can provide you with a menu. But our chef, aware you're coming, has put together a very special menu for you tonight. We have um, some oysters that are literally from a couple holes over, a couple ponds over from here that are incredible. We highly recommend those. He has done a butter poached lobster for you. He knows you love lobster, which is true, but again, I don't know why they know this. And he has a butter poached lobster for you. We also have something that is a, um, it, it's a piece of monkfish that we think you just have to try because it came in today and it's just fabulous. And I said, you know what, you guys bring me anything you want. Just give me a glass of Chardonnay and I'm gonna feel good about it. And so they do, and the food starts coming, the food's incredible, and I'm sitting there for about 10 minutes by myself, eating, when a man comes down the stairs, and he's incredibly nattily dressed. He's got, you know, he's got the pocket square, and he's got a three-piece suit on brown, and he's probably in his mid-late 50s, and he comes down, and he has a British accent, and he says to me, well, you must be Mr. Green. And I said, yes, I am, and he sees the book, and he says, now is that the book? And I said, yeah, this is, this is the book. He's like, the perfect liar. Now, what's that about? And I said, well, it's about, um, it's about when someone, uh, you know, unwittingly uh, marries a sociopath. And he says, oh, the story of my ex-wife. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he said, and then he introduced himself, and he tells me he's the innkeeper. And this is his inn. And he says, by the way, I want you to know, I'm embarrassed to say this, I have never read any of your books. And I'm like, oh, that's fine. That's great. This place is amazing, by the way. Thank you so much. He said, I haven't read the books. He said, I have seen a bunch of the movies. And I stop and I think, is there an alternate universe where my books are made into movies? <laughs> I mean, they've been close, but it's never happened. And he's like, I've loved them all. You know, there's that one with, oh God, uh, you know, Matthew McConaughey's in one, and that was fantastic. And, and there was that one with Matt Damon. And, and, um, and he said, oh, that one, the, the first one, the Tom Cruise, the firm. And I said, oh, that's, uh, I said, that's, that's John Grisham. And he goes, that's not you? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, that's, that's John Grisham. He's like, oh. He's like, my mistake. He's like, my mistake. You know, I told everybody that my wife's favorite writer was coming and I, some kind of confusion. Anyway, they thought it was John Grisham. So he's totally nice. I have this great dinner. I go to bed. The next morning, I get up. I come downstairs. And I go to the front desk. I'm like, you guys still serving breakfast? And the guy's like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, but there's a... It's like a Dunkin' Donuts out by the highway <laughs> on your way out. So that was my night as John Grisham. And uh, the next night at a reading in Mystic, Connecticut, I told that story. And two different people brought me John Grisham books to sign. I signed both of them. So <laughs> Anyway, that's life on book tour. Rest of tour was great, by the way. Um, 
Yeah, so this book is a little bit different for me. I mean, in some ways, it's more of a, I guess it's more of a thriller. I've written, uh, I've written love stories. I've written, um, you know, The Headmaster's Wife, which Anne referenced, I think was my most popular book, which I thought was actually a quiet meditation on grief, and people read it as a thriller, and it did really well. Um, and I think it, you know, I think my books tend to sort of cross genres. This one probably follows some more conventional tropes of what people think of as a sort of domestic thriller or a psychological thriller. Um, you know, it's the story of, of a marriage and a couple that moves to Burlington, Vermont, and um, from New York City, and he has become very quickly, the husband, very, very famous in the art world, although he doesn't actually make any art, he just talks about it. Um, and and uh, it turns out he's not at all who one thinks he is. In fact, he's assumed somebody else's identity to become this other thing. I'm not giving too much away because a lot of this happens at the beginning of the book. But shortly after they arrive at their place in Burlington, um, his wife, Susanna, who suffers from um, severe panic attacks, begins finding notes on their front door, handwritten notes. And the first one says, I know who you are, and that's how the book opens. Um, I want to read a piece to you about Susanna, because to me, she's my favorite character. And uh, this is about before she met Max, who's her husband. And, um, her, and this is really about her and her first husband whose name is Joseph, who was her psychologist, who she married, and he continued to treat her after they were married, which is, as you probably know, highly unethical um, by any standard. So let me read this piece for you. They had a, okay, let me go back to this. Here we go. This is after they meet and after they're together. A week later, Susanna left her high-rise dorm and moved in with him. Once a week, she visited his office as she had before, and they pretended they were not lovers, that they did not live together, that she did not want to be his wife. For those 55 minutes, he was her therapist, and he challenged her, and sometimes she pushed back. But their life at home always seeped in, and it was different. Most important to Susanna, though, her panic receded. When she was with Joseph, it always did, as if he were some giant placebo she popped into her mouth. Just hearing his voice calmed her. In those early years together, he owned her completely. One moment, Susanna was all wild pony, and the next she was channeling the passive compliance of her Spanish mother, and Joseph knew how to get her there. He saw right through her. One time they were in session, early summer, and they'd been living together for a few months. Outside the windows of his office, it was pouring hard, a late afternoon thunderstorm and dark like winter. Susanna had been talking about her parents, how they didn't understand why she would want to go to art school, why anyone would ever think that becoming a painter was an option. Her parents were immigrants who left Madrid when she was six and her sister was eight and brought them to Queens for a job where her dad drove a delivery truck. Her parents were deeply Catholic and all through high school not a single boy had ever made it past the doorway of their small house. Her mother went to mass every single morning. Her father went on both weekend mornings. Susanna knew the things they hoped for her, and none of them involved whom she quickly became, the girl who in high school smoked pot and hung out with black boys with dreadlocks. She was the girl who only wanted to draw things, not study. She found everything else boring and distracting. She embodied everything her parents feared about coming to America. Why couldn't she be more like her big sister, Christina, who studied accounting and already found a good man, a fellow Spanish driver named David who had his eyes on Wall Street and doing something with his life, on making a family? How could she tell her parents that what they had, the life, the beliefs, the closed tiny world was exactly what she was running from? That she only believed in Jesus on Sundays and then only for a moment when Susanna found herself staring at him suspended above the altar and something about the sadness in his downward turned face on the cross spoke to her, not as a god but as a sad-eyed man. A few weeks before, Christina had come to visit her in the city. She had made the mistake of telling her about Joseph for Susanna loved him and wanted her sister to know. And even though she saw in Christina's face the sharp look of disapproval, she pressed forward. That night after Christina left, Susanna's father called her. End it, he said in Spanish, or don't come back here. I love him. End it, or don't come back, Susanna. You should meet him, Papa. The man is my age. You are a child. It is sick and wrong. End it, Susanna. He hung up. Sitting in Joseph's office later, they were talking about this, and suddenly Joseph's eyes narrowed, and he gave her that look, the questioning one he had. You are taking your birth control. What kind of question is that? Of course I am. I haven't seen you take it. What are you saying, that I'm trying to get pregnant? Joseph shrugged as if this were no big deal. 
Some women do it, you know. They do it to accelerate things, to make them more serious. I want you to know I'd be very upset, Susanna. She started to cry more in anger than in sadness. She rose out of her chair. Is this what you think of me? Is this who you really think I am? Sit down. Don't you tell me what to fucking do. She left out into his waiting room, down the rickety wooden stairs, and through the door to 4th Street in the falling rain. Another time, Joseph gave her a bunch of tests to establish a baseline, he said, including one, a questionnaire he called the fuck you test. The higher you scored on it, the less likely you were to say fuck you, or so he said. It had a more technical name, but she didn't remember what it was. It measured both conformity and leadership, she remembered. On conformity, she scored only 2% on a scale of 100, which meant she was very likely to say fuck you, and he should have known that, she thought, and that what followed was his fault. After that afternoon fight in his office, he wanted to watch her take her birth control at night, and he was vigilant about it. Each night before bed, he waited for Susanna to slip that small white pill in her tongue and swallow it, looking at her with some kind of paternalistic pride in her view as if she were a child. That look of smug self-satisfaction on his face made her pretend a month later she had her period, and instead of the white pills, one day after another, she took the little red ones instead, the fake ones you pop just to stay in the routine. During that time and on those summer nights with the sounds of the city filling her ears, Susanna rode Joseph as if it were her job, and that was the thing about it. She was only 21, and with all the wisdom of that age, she wasn't thinking about a baby or a life, but only about getting pregnant. It wasn't conscious, this act, and as impossible as that sounds, it was simply about not wanting Joseph or anyone else telling her what to do. Susanna couldn't abide by that, which is why she went to art school in the first place. She knew she was pregnant long before she confirmed it and long before she told Joseph. Susanna felt that baby growing in her like a plant. It reminded her of when she was a kid and her father would tell her not to eat watermelon seeds, that if she did, inside her belly, a watermelon would grow and take over her whole insides, leaves growing up toward her mouth. Susanna used to believe that, and sometimes in the bed she shared with Christina, Susanna would lie under the covers at night and imagine what that would feel like. Her father said it to make her laugh or maybe to scare her, but it didn't either. Susanna loved the idea that she could make fruit. For 16 weeks she harbored this secret. Her belly rounded out, her breasts got bigger and sensitive, and Joseph didn't notice at all. He didn't notice that a calm had come over her, as if the fire and the anger she had carried like a cross had somehow been, extinguished is the wrong word, turned into love. Susanna loved Joseph more and took care of him, and he in turn began to show her a kindness that went beyond his interest in her body and dissecting her mind. Some mornings those days before his first appointment, they would lie in bed for hours, both awake, curled into each other like sleeping puppies. Then she told him. His furry showed, fury showed in his balled up fists in the vein prominent on his forehead, and for a moment she thought he might strike her. Abort it. She shook her head. I won't. I'm Catholic. He laughed at this. Catholic? Oh, come on. Being raised Catholic doesn't make you Catholic. We're not having a baby. You're right. We are not. I am. In that moment, she saw something that she had not previously known to be true. Joseph needed her as much as she needed him. All along, she had felt as if he owned all the power, that she lived in his place, not theirs, that he was healing her and not her, him. But in the truth, he didn't want to lose her. He couldn't imagine losing her. Susanna found something sad in seeing this in him, all his supremacy fading from his knowing black eyes and leaving a paunchy middle-aged man in its place. A healthy baby boy with a thatch of black hair and dark Spanish eyes came that following February. She named him Ferdinand after her favorite children's book about the bull that doesn't want to fight and only wants to smell the flowers. She named him Ferdinand, but she called him Freddy. And she realized that while she thought she had been in love before she had a baby, she had not, not even close. Susanna was entirely unprepared for what she felt. In Freddie's first month, sometimes it overwhelmed her and she couldn't stop crying. For all his years of listening and treatments, Joseph had no way of understanding why she was inconsolable, for it was definitely closer to joy than sadness, but somewhere in the ambiguous middle between those poles. On Easter Sunday of that year, she bundled up Ferdinand and took him in a cab out to Queens. It was the end of March and the day was sunny but unseasonably cold. Her family didn't know she was coming. When the cab went over the bridge from Manhattan, the East River gray below them, she looked out the window to the small web of neighborhoods, tiny houses upon tiny houses, where her family had moved to from Spain when she was a child. Susanna had the cab drop her off a few houses away from the small ranch house that her parents owned. 
She wore a scarf covering her hair, a bright red one, and a long overcoat, and cradled Ferdinand in her arms, his tiny body within the warmth of her coat. He had fallen asleep on the ride and was just waking up, beautiful and sleepy-eyed, and not yet asking for milk. When she reached the front of the house, she stopped for a moment. She knew that with a scarf on her head, she was virtually unrecognizable. Even though the day was bright and sunny, her parents' house on the shady, shady side of the street and through the picture window, she saw her sister, Christina, in front of the dining room table, setting it for dinner. Behind her was her husband, David, holding their toddler, Susanna's nephew, Jorge, whom she had never met. Her father, short and stout, with his head of thick gray hair, was tossing the boy's hair. Her mother, as usual, was invisible, no doubt in the kitchen, tending to a roast leg of lamb, her potatoes stained red with paprika, and a cast iron pan on the stove top. Susanna walked up the driveway, up the cement path to the metal screen door, the same one that had always been there, a giant X over the faded glass, the one that slammed shut when it closed. Behind it, the storm door was a solid pale yellow, no windows. She looked at the glowing orange circle around the doorbell, then down at Ferdinand, his big dark eyes open and wet and looking back at her. Then she rang the doorbell. She heard footfalls. The door swung open and it was Christina and Susanna watched her face go strange when she saw the sun in Susanna's arms. Susanna, what? But before Susanna could answer, her father was there, shorter than her sister, his shirt with his name on it, his thick gray hair pushed off to the right side and his wrinkled olive face. He looked from Susanna's face down to Ferdinand. Papa, Susanna said, this is your grandson. That's not my grandson, he spat back. He came out of my body. Her father shook his head, his eyes were dark. Not in my house, Susanna, you are not welcome here. She began to cry and her sister, now behind her father, did as well. Her father loved children and Susanna did not expect this cruelty. Behind them, Susanna saw her small mother in her apron, and despite the wanting and the sadness in her eyes, Susanna knew her mother was no help at all. Her mother didn't even bother to move forward. Papa, we're here for Easter. He closed the door, and she heard the turn of the lock, and on cue, Freddie started to scream. Her baby was hungry. They moved away from the house into the curb where she sat down in the cold day, opened her coat, and unbuttoned her blouse to give her son a nipple. She felt the release into his mouth like a shudder. She leaned her face down into his wet black hair while he sucked and she wiped her tears on his tiny head. They were in New York City on a neighborhood street, one of the most densely populated places on earth. In the distance, she heard the rumble of cars on the expressway somewhere above them, but the street itself was holiday quiet. Everyone was inside. Behind them stood her childhood home in front across the river lay Manhattan. In six years, Joseph would die of a heart attack, making Susanna a widow at 27. But in that moment, watching her baby nurse, she decided the world would always just be the two of them, her and Freddie, and that was okay. What else did they need? 13 years later, Max walked into a party. Thank you. What do you want to know? <laughs> All right, good. Is That's good. That What's that? Is the whole book that happy? Yeah, it gets. It gets. Yes, it's pretty. It gets a little le more sad and then even sadder. Okay. No, it's. It has. It has moments of levity, maybe. No, it, it did. We heard them. Yeah, you heard them. Little ones. Um, yeah, I don't know. Tragedy is so much interest, more interesting than comedy most of the time. For me, anyway. Very compelling, despite all sometimes we thought, wow, this is not a happy marriage. No, no, that wasn't a happy marriage. But there are moments of triumph, I think. Yeah. And you had a question? Yeah, so are you one of those people who writes early, early in the morning? No, I don't do anything early, early in the morning. <laughs> you know, I am, uh, uh, it's, it's, I get this question a lot about, about, you know, how you write or what your habits are. and. Um, you know, for me, uh, you know, before I started Vermont College of Fine Arts, I used to write full time. So I had much more of a disciplined schedule. You know, I would write in the mornings, not super early, but breakfast, newspapers, three hours of writing, exercise, other business, stuff like that. Um, but being a college president the last 13 years, I've had to learn to write differently. So I spent a lot of time with the book in my head. Um, and I write in smaller segments of time. And so I would write a lunch 
I write in the evenings more likely. Um, I like to write in public places. Every house I've owned, I've had like amazingly awesome writing studios, like beautiful places above a barn, you know, and, and I never ever use them. If I was home, I'd write the kitchen counter. <laughs> And I prefer writing at restaurant bars. <coughs> I like noise around me and where I write in Montpelier, places I generally write, um, everybody knows who I am and they know if my fingers are moving, they'll leave me alone. And if my fingers aren't moving, they can come up and say hello. And uh, so it's something about sort of ambient noise that's helpful to me if I'm, I'm home, there's too many distractions, the phone. I, I, I don't ever put on the internet when I go to a restaurant. So there's something that allows me to focus about having people around me that makes it easier for me to work, so um, that's generally what I do. It also depends on what part of a book you're in. Uh, early parts of the book are very hard. As a book gets its momentum and going, I, I end up writing a lot more because I, it's, it's kind of a rush to get it out of you, you know? Yes? Do you like live with your characters, like you them talking to you on the subway, or yeah. how they, their relationship with money, or like, yeah. like, how real are they? Well, these two are both super murdery, so I'm really glad they don't live with me all the time. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's funny. I find myself, um, I, particularly before I drift off to sleep at night, I find myself thinking about them. You know, at, at a certain point, they become real. I mean, I, it's, it sounds so hokey to me to say this, because I, I used to, when people say this, and they say, that's so silly, like, but, um, you know, there is a part of the world in which uh, you inhabit when you're writing a book that you really do start to live in a little bit. Um, not just with the characters, but the geography, the place, you know. I mean, a lot of stuff I drop in my own life, but physical places in this book, I can picture their house and I can picture Joseph's apartment, places I've never been. Um, my friend Richard Russo told a great story about this once. I don't know if you've ever read his work, but a fantastic writer, but he was... Um, they were making a movie of uh, Nobody's Fool um, with Paul Newman, and he was gonna, going to go to the set to watch them film it. And uh, it was somewhere in uh, you know, New York State, uh, Hudson River Valley area where they were doing the filming. And um, so he drove from Maine over to there to see what was going on, got in the hotel. And the director called him to the hotel, and he said, yeah, we're shooting the scene at so-and-so's bar. And Russo said, okay, I'll be, I'll be right there, and hung up the phone. And, uh, and then got in his car and started driving. And he realized he had no idea where the hell he was going because in his mind he was going to the bar in the book, which was like, you know, you go through the woods here, you take a left and it's down on the right and it doesn't actually exist. And he hung up so quick that he had to call the guy back and say, wait, where are you actually doing this? So, I mean, I do think there is an element of that where you really fall into the story, you know, part of it. Yes? Do you know the end when you began? Um, not fully. You know, I usually know the climax of a book or what I think is going to be the climax of the book. This book actually has maybe two or three different sort of significant climaxes, a little different structurally than some of the other things I've done. Um, but I have a sense of where it's going and I write toward that and then there are surprises along the way that sometimes have you reshuffle the whole structure and what you're trying to do. Um, that was certainly true of Headmaster's Wife, which also has a very unusual uh, narrative structure. It's, it's really two books in one. Same story told from two different points of view with a pretty big surprise in the middle. So um, and sometimes I don't know that till I stumble upon it and then I think, oh, it would be really cool to do this. But I generally have a sense of what I'm driving toward and what the sort of defining event of the book is going to be, for lack of a better term. And I write toward that and sometimes I end up changing entirely, but that's how I, that's how I go. Yes, sir. Did you ever get a bill from the hotel in Westerly? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, my publisher did, and they weren't very happy. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, no, they did. They did. It was, uh, I was a little above my, uh, my budget they give me for travel on that leg. Yeah. Uh, what inspired you to uh, write The Headmaster's Wife? Yeah, that's a it's a good it's a great question. So, um, did, did you read the book? Do you know yes. you did? Okay. I love that book. Oh, thank really you. Book. Thank you very much. Um, well, you know, I was uh, God. I was I was writing a completely different book, which was I was I was initially writing a story. I had this idea of somebody coming back from Iraq and um, having been in the war, and coming back to sort of a changed landscape and changed life, and, uh, and and what that was like. And there was one piece of that original book 
um, that is actually in the headmaster's wife, which is their son Ethan, who was in Iraq. Um, and then in my own personal life, um, uh, my, my wife and I had our, our second daughter was born uh, very early, and um, she lived for six months and she died. And so I was writing, I was spending, I was running this brand new college um, and driving down Dartmouth Hitchcock, where she was. Uh, we were sort of splitting shifts. My wife would sit with her all day, and I would come sit with her at night. Um, and I found actually the, she was in a neo intensive care unit, which is a completely crazy, traumatic place to be, but also was remarkably mainly because of nurses who were just really remarkable people. Um, also places where there's a lot of beauty, surprisingly. And, um, and I found it was actually an excellent place to write because this was a newborn baby who was basically sleeping most of the time. And so I was sitting next to her bed and I was writing this book about this Iraq war soldier coming back. And then when she died, um, I began to change the book to write a book about what happens if someone um, loses a child and instead of holding it together, they completely lose their mind which is really what the topic of the headmaster's wife is. It's about a headmaster at a boarding school in Vermont who son dies in Iraq, we don't actually know that, and, and, and he's an unreliable narrator who's telling a slightly different story. Um, but that was the inspiration for it, was really a way to channel and understand um, the grief I felt as a parent and what that was like into fiction. And I have to tell you, it was a great outlet for me, honestly. I mean, um, and I think one of the reasons why that book really resonated with so many people was because of the level of honesty that's in there. And a lot of people assumed that um, I personally related to Arthur, who is the male lead character, who because he ran a school in Vermont and I ran a school in Vermont, and that somehow, you know, he lost a child, I lost a child, the same person. But it was really Elizabeth, his wife, in the second part of the book where she describes her feelings of grief and how she. Um, was processing them that was much truer to my own experience. And I think getting that down on paper uh, was cathartic for me. Um, yes? This will have to be our last question. Okay. You know, when you think of transition to something that hasn't been spoken, you established the co Vermont College of Fine Arts, mm -hmm. which to me is an absolutely wonderful gift uh, and also a very bold uh, kind of thing for someone as young as you would have done yeah. in 2006. Uh, it sounds like you want to train minds to expand besides your own and to express themselves and share themselves but with other people. Uh, yeah. Can you just reflect on that? Yeah, that's a, a thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, I remember telling uh, somebody, oh, it was Ron Charles in Washington Post called me or something else, he's a book reviewer, and he said to me, so you started a college? And I said, yeah, and he said, where are you from, like the 19th century? Um, <laughs> And, and, and the story was, I mean, I don't know if I would do it today, but I think it was sort of a good mixture of naivete and hubris that I had at that point in my life um, that allowed me to take on a project that people thought was kind of absurd. Uh, but there was an old campus that was gonna close and had really good MFA programs, one of which I was a graduate of and that I had taught in. My friends worked there and, um, you know, it was gonna basically be shut down, turn into condominiums and, um, you know, only in Vermont, in a way, because Vermont is so small that if you have a crazy idea, um, you know, you can, you can get access to people. And, uh, you know, I was able to go see the governor. And, um, you know, the only real ability I had, frankly, was I did no higher education because I'd worked in it. And I come from a higher ed family. My dad was a college president. My brother's president of Colby College in Maine. So it's a bit of a disease. Um, and, uh, you know, I, um, you know, you could get in to see the governor. And I was able to tell the story of what we were trying to do, and people listened to it enough that eventually it became real, even though we had no money. And the college address was my house initially. Um, but I'm very proud of it. I stepped down from the presidency just this past month after 13 years, and uh, I think it was time for a transition and for someone new to come in, and frankly, I was tired. Um, it's a long time to run a college. I was the youngest college president in the country when Vermont College of Fine Arts started, and when I stepped down last month, I was the second longest serving president in the state uh, out of 26 schools. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So, but yeah, I think, you know, I think, and I, and I know we have to wrap up, but I, I, you know, I think art is really important regardless of the art. Um, I think it, uh, I think it defines human experience in a way that's really profound and important. I think that, um, 
you know, I think that art education really matters more for the community aspect of it, even than the educational part. I think great colleges are sort of movable feasts and ports in the storm for people um, to come together from around the country, which is what happens at VCFA, and, uh, and to find a place that allows them to go out in the world and create meaning in whatever shape it takes. And, you know, we have writers there, and we have filmmakers, and we have designers, and uh, we have visual artists, and we have composers of music. And the thing that I learned from being around all those people over these years, which I didn't know before, um, is that we're all telling stories. We're just using different mediums to do it. And storytelling is the oldest form of human expression. And when we tell stories, we get to something deeper and more profound than we do just from living. And so um, thank you for the question. And thank you for the time. Great. That's where we're going to stop. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.